what I'm going to tell you first is what I prepared before I got to know you. <laughs> but we know each other already, so don't uh, worry if I greet you again, okay? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, and if I may say so, dear friends, I extend warm greetings and a sincere welcome to all visitors from beautiful Italy and wish everyone an interesting stay in the city of Nuremberg. My heartfelt greetings also go over to Mr. Michael Helmbrecht and Dr. Siegfried Grillmeier, the organizers of our meeting. I hope and trust it will be okay for everyone if we speak to each other in English. Can you all hear me? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> Good. My name is Rudy Teslansky. I was born in Nuremberg on the 2nd of June, 1933. In August 1939, when I was six years old and Nazi terror increased day by day, my parents sent me on one of the last kinder transports to a cousin in London. I still remember my mother's last words. She kissed me goodbye and said, Rudy, you go ahead now with a group of other children. We've already got our tickets for the next ship, so we'll be together again in three weeks' time. But we were already in August 1939, and only a few days later, on the 1st of September, the war broke out. Whereupon the next ship was cancelled and my parents were unable to leave Germany. I spent the whole period of the war as a child refugee in England. For over six years, I had no contact whatsoever with my parents in Germany. Without my mom and dad, I felt completely on my own. Even in my new surroundings, I had absolutely nobody around with whom I could speak a word of German. That is when I knew I must concentrate on learning English. I started school in London where naturally everybody around me spoke English. I listened to every word I heard and soon began trying to talk. It was wartime. Night after night, we had to go into a crowded air raid shelter. I hated the damp mattress and got used to my cough. London, the same as the south coast of England, was hit by countless bombs and after every air raid many places were on fire. Feared most of all were German rockets which had been specially designed for the bombardment of London. When Germany started bombing England, the British government immediately began to evacuate hundred thousands of children to the north of England where they were out of danger. I was put into the care of a Jewish boys home in Ilkley, Yorkshire. Ilkley is a very nice place and I suggest if somebody wants to go to England for a holiday also go to England, to Ilkley. I thought of my parents every day. All the time I wondered what was happening with them in Germany. From 1939 to 1941, in accordance with German racial law, in effect, racial law, Rassegesetz, 
My parents were forced to work in a hard labor factory. Besides that, they had to give up their house, which was immediately taken over by a Nazi family. My parents were left with no other choice than to make preparations for their deportation. Can you imagine how, how terrible that all was? On the 26th of November 1941, Gestapo came in police trucks and took my parents, my grandmother, as well as 510 healthy-looking Jews to a collecting point where several shacks had been built to accommodate them prior to their deportation. They looked for Jüdische Arbeiter, Arbeiter. Denn am Ende der Reise hätten die viel zu tun gehabt. Also ich habe daraus gemacht, healthy looking Jews. Every person was allowed to take up to 50 kilograms of luggage and equipment on the train. The first train to destination East Europe left Nuremberg on the 29th of November 1941. As the train began to move, several passengers ran to the windows to see the direction the train was traveling. The train passed the Jewish cemetery, which for many passengers was a bad omen. After three days and nights, the train reached a transfer station near Riga. There, SS men used rubber coshes to rust the people out of the train. <coughs> An elderly woman fell on snow-covered slippery ground. A Jewish dentist tried to help her up, but was hit in the face with the butt of a rifle. You understand? A butt of a rifle? Okay. Forgetting for a moment where he was, he made a, a remark whereupon he was taken around a corner and never seen again. They killed him. Now back to me. In 1945, after the war, I left the boys home in Yorkshire and returned to my cousin in London where I went back to school. One day, our doorbell rang. I opened the door and standing in front of me was a man in the uniform of an American soldier. He looked at me and said, Are you Rudy? Are you Rudy Czeslanski? I answered, Yes, that's me. Whereupon the man told me he was stationed in Ansbach, Germany and at present on vacation in London. He said that in Ansbach he had made the acquaintance of a man called Julius Czeslanski, my father. As the soldier told him that he would soon be visiting London, my father gave him my London address, where I was with my cousin, and asked him if possible to visit me there. This he did soon afterwards. I was now 13 years old. I wrote my father a letter asking him whether he would advise me to come back and live with him in Germany. He happily agreed and within a short spell of time I began packing my bags. I thanked my cousin for everything she had done for me and left London to live with my father in Germany. Seeing my father for the first time again after six years was a day I will never forget. His health had suffered due to the hardship and terror of four German concentration camps. It was impossible for him to tell me anything about my mother. If I asked questions about my mother, he just cried and said 
that on their arrival at Stutthof, extermination camp, he had been forcefully separated from my mother and had never seen her again. It took me several years to find out what had really happened to my mother. It was finally in Riga where a few years ago I was invited to attend the inauguration of a memorial in the Riga woods, the terrible place where thousands of Jews had been slaughtered by the Nazis. But during an evening get-together, a lady came over to me and introduced herself as Gertrude Schneider from the University of New York. She told me that she too had been an inmate of Stutthof, where she had seen and spoken to my mother. In fact, she told me she was near my mother when she died on the 12th December 1944 at the young age of 32. Now, let me return to what I was telling you in connection with the train journey to East Europe. Upon arrival of the train at its destination, Riga, the passengers were forced to march in deep snow to a concentration camp called Jungfernhof. This camp had originally been a farm, but the stables were now fitted with rows of bunk beds for the inmates. Transports of Jews arrived in Jungfernhof at regular intervals, for example from Hamburg, from Stuttgart, from Vienna. Within a short period of time, the camp housed a total of more than 5,000 inmates. Now, you might want to ask what happened to the Jews after they arrived in Riga. I can tell you. The first people murdered in the Riga woods were the Jews from Germany, Austria and Czechoslovakia. In the Riga woods today, in addition to a total of 55 mass graves, we find dozens or more of trees with bullet holes and burn scars going back to the shooting massacre and the fact that in 1944 the dead bodies of thousands of Jews were burnt prior to the retreat of the German army. Still understand? Good. In 2001, a long time after the war, a memorial of black marble was built in the Riga woods in memory of the thousands of Jews who had been murdered there. I personally was invited to attend the inauguration ceremony and as requested brought with me a roll of parchment containing the names of all persons who from Nuremberg had been deported to Riga. Same as all other visitors from Germany, I placed my roll of parchment into a hollow space of the memorial which had now become a holy and worthy space for eternal rest. Let me tell you what happened to my grandparents. Around the turn of the century, my grandparents, Alexander and Franziska Czeslanski, came to Germany from Vilna and lived in Ansbach on the first floor of Maximilianstrasse 26, above a cigarette, cigar and tobacco shop. After many years, the original shop owner was about to retire and asked my grandfather whether he would like to buy the shop and take it over. My grandfather bought the shop and reopened it in his name. Business was good until Nazis came in and made trouble. The worst trouble, now listen to this, suffered by my parents occurred in the, I said, Reichspogrom night, yeah, Reichspogrom night, 
when a troop of Nazis came into the house and forced my grandparents to accompany them to Ansbach's Retzathalle, where they were treated in brutal manner and forced at gunpoint to sign a contract to sell their house and shop to a Nazi for a ridiculously low price. House and shop changed hands. The buyer was an SR man, a special agent of the Nazis. Can, me, can uh, mir irgendjemand sagen, für was SR steht? Ich habe jetzt einen special oh, agent. In, 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 in English, English, please, the question. Can, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say that in Italian. <laughs> or, or. Thank you. Sturmabteilung. Das waren dann die Kerle, die die am meisten uh, die die die. Those words. We did distinguish always between the SA and the SA. The SAs were the the elite soldiers of Hitler, yeah. but the SA actually were those who came from the First World War, and there were so many there because they, after the First World War, they then they not refined work and so on. So was, and so Hitler really needed those. They were not the area, and I don't know what the ones Hitler wanted. The elite, but they were the masses, so he really yeah. needed them. They, they were be. there from the first moment. They were. They must have been very old people if they came from the First World War. Yeah, and uh, yeah. yeah, and so then because on the Nazi party rally grounds you had to, in the beginning you had both the SA and SS, but then later on the SA was regulated by the SS. <coughs> we write Thank you. the documentation center about them. Yes. Doing these phases about them and the first rooms. Yes. <coughs> the Thank you for your English. I love your English. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So how far did I get? Yeah, they forced my grandparents yeah. to, yeah. <laughs> As my grandparents had, was forced at gunpoint to sign a contract to sell the house and the shop to a Nazi for a ridiculously low price. Okay, somewhat later, on the 9th of June, my grandparents received an official document stating that with effect from 1st September 1939 they must leave Ansbach and its surroundings and never come back. My grandparents moved to Munich and went into hiding. It was there that my grandfather sat down on a bench, had a heart attack and immediately died. My grandmother was betrayed and deported by the Nazis to Piaski, a place in East Poland with a ghetto and a regular transport connection to Belzec, a nearby extermination camp. I have no doubt that Belzec was the place where my grandmother was killed. Incidentally, in May 2007, I was invited to join a group of people on a special trip to East Poland, which also took me to Belzec, where I discovered that within a period of nine months, over 500,000 Jews had been murdered. During the six years of my stay in England, I found that English had become my normal language. In an all-British environment, I had lost the German I had once spoken as a six-year-old kid. In order to help me learn German again, my father put me into the fourth class of a German secondary school where, after initial difficulties, I learned German well and also felt well in my new environment. I made many friends to whom I am still attached. After finishing school, I received an offer from MAN Nürnberg 
to join their translation department and help them with English-German and German-English translations. I accepted and worked for MAN from 1953 until 1996 for a total period of 43 years. My father came back to Ansbach, where his house and shop, taken away from him by the Nazis, was returned to him by law. Many years after my mother's death, my father remarried. He had fallen in love with a lady from Munich by the name of Edith Güldenstein, who was to become the mother of the young lady sitting next to me, my sister Ruth Czeslanski. <coughs> my father was put in charge of synagogue services in Ansbach's Barock synagogue, a beautiful synagogue uh, in Ansbach, uh, where services were generally held on Friday evenings and frequently also visited by young Jewish American soldiers stationed in Katerbach near Ansbach. In this connection it might be interesting for you to hear that my father was famous for his beautiful voice as a tenor and also had his place in the synagogue choir. At the beginning of my story I told you that in 1941 when the train to East Europe left Nuremberg and passed a Jewish cemetery, that many of the passengers thought this was a bad omen. They were right. Of the 512 Jewish citizens of Nuremberg in the train, only 16 came back. I thank you for listening to my story. Thank you very much.